Welcome to Straight Talk, one-on-one -on -one conversation with newsmakers and opinion shapers. I am Dhaka Tribune editor Zafar Subhan and my guest today is Dr. Rabana Huck, an award-winning poet and Bangladeshi businesswoman, the managing director of the Muhammadi Group. Uh, Rabana, wonderful of you to join us on the show today. Pleasure is all mine. Okay, well thank you. And Let's get right into it. I want to talk a little bit about these protests which have been roiling the garment industry. They have just recently died down, but can you tell us a little bit about what they were, what the issues were, what was behind them and how they have been resolved? Well, the protests uh, happened because the workers were protesting against the minimum wage structure. Okay, yes. It wasn't about the minimum wage of grade seven. You know, mm -hmm. we have seven grades. That's right. Uh, but they were mostly upset about the wage adjustment in the other grades. Right. Uh, we probably didn't address them properly. Okay. Therefore, the, the anxiety and, and the stress. But at the same time, uh, we also had instigators from outside sure. um, approaching our factories and mm -hmm. talking to our workers, getting them down on the streets, protesting. Yeah. So, you know, there were outside uh, instigations as well. Sure. Um, how it was resolved? Well, the um, the government decided to revise uh, the, a few grades and therefore adjustments have been made to all the grades, uh, literally. Um, some significantly, some pretty much insignificantly, but you know, adjustment has been done, it right. has been addressed. And ever since uh, there, the protests have died down, the workers have gone back to factory and so what can we do? I mean, here's the thing, you know, you have a mechanism for addressing these concerns. The government set a 10-person committee to look into this as soon as the protest started with a lot of worker representation. Still, the protest did continue for several days afterwards. You've mentioned outside agitation. Is there any way, you know, of course, all industries, in the media industry, of course, we have a wage board, you know, people, you know, people want more wages, that happens. Is there a way of resolving these issues in such a way that perhaps you know we don't see protests like this in the future a more productive way of moving forward but absolutely zafar you see um what happened was the government did react very quickly yeah um if you remember the commerce minister had taken around a month yeah. and he said that you know we will be uh, setting everything right within a month but it was resolved in less than four days yes so which was remarkable right um on the side of the government but on the other hand, if we really want to avoid these kind of confrontations, I am absolutely, um, I, well, I, I'll insist that uh, the owner and labor relationship has to improve. Okay. We need to be in our factories more. We need to be talking to the workers more. Um, in one of our factories, we had a protest. Mm -hmm. We have eight factories, and in one, we had a protest. I literally FaceTimed with the trade union leaders yeah. while I was going to the factory so that they yeah. wouldn't get down. And I said, look, I'm coming. The moment I went there, Zafar, the first thing that I did was I said, I want to have lunch with you because I'm starving. Yeah. So you see, that's the thing. They just want to feel that they're close to you. Yeah. And it really doesn't take much. Well, to I mean, it seems that. to me if that's the case, this is something which is resolvable. Absolutely resolvable. Yeah. It's it's. We only keep on talking about the grade seven and the minimum wage, but our workers yeah. are never paid by grade seven. I mean, sure. we have that's just at the grades, very yes. basic entry yes. level. They'll move up very shortly. Ninety-five percent of our workers are in grade three. Yeah. So okay. nobody talks about that. We are right. also doing fair wage practices. Yes. Uh, we are in that project as well, where we apply skill uh, metrics. Mm -hmm. You know, there are lots of things that can be done. The only thing that we need to make our workers understand, and I think that's missing in the equation, is, um, is, is the fact that skill is related to wage. Sure. So productivity matters. The average uh, efficiency in Bangladesh is only around 40, 45%, whereas yeah. China, Sri Lanka are at 60, much 65, higher. much, much higher. So how, how come? Why is that the case? Um, well, I, I saw in Vietnam myself Mm -hmm. uh, the, the workers literally handle every piece of garment with utmost care. Yeah. Literacy level is high. Right. Awareness is much more. They're more um, mindful when they handle the garments. With our workers, it, um, it, it's skill. 
It's lack of Is skill. it getting better? I mean, you know, we've been doing this for 30 years or yes, so. Yes, yes. So are better. we moving up the value chain? We are, we are. And yeah. also automation is setting in as well. Yeah. We are, we're not moving up the value chain in, in that respect in that sense, really. Yeah. But, but skill upgradation but skill has, has, been, happened has been mm -hmm. happening. But then again, yeah. workers don't stick around in the factories for more than a few years. Yeah. So you know, there's again a whole set of new workers who come in and they learn the job. Somehow or the other, we haven't been very good with industrial engineering so far. Okay. That's an area where we need to be concentrating a little bit. Is that bit something more. where perhaps the leadership of the garment industry could, you know, take the lead and say, okay, well, this is something we should focus on? Um, it seems that, you know, a lot of these issues which you're talking about is something which a good leadership could address. Uh, certainly, Zafar. I think there are multiple issues where um, leadership could address. I think the first one would be the relationship between the workers and the right. and the owners. Uh, the other thing would be skill upgradation for mm -hmm. sure. Um, there's a lot to be done. You know, there are just Bangladesh often very um, unfortunately suffers from a severe image deficit. Yeah. And I think that could be addressed with a more human approach. Sure. I think we could be probably a little more forward looking. Mm -hmm. And and the problem in our sector is we're constantly firefighting right so that kind of stops us from from setting our goals mm. if we could basically concentrate and set our vision for the next 10 years yeah that would, that so would and help. is there recognition within the industry or is that something which is slowly coming has been building over the last few years recognition from for the, this this need that you know you don't want to be firefighting you want to do some long-term planning that if all of you got together as an industry these problems are in fact resolvable or is there perhaps some kind of a division within the industry I mean, i'm not sure there's no division within mm -hmm. the industry but i think there's a lack of uh, planning. Yeah. I mean, I think there's. We, we could be more united. We could mm -hmm. be more um, focused on yeah. our on our goals because our goals are the same. Mm -hmm. We just want a very compliant Bangladesh. Yeah. And for me, compliance and and for many of my my colleagues, compliance does not necessarily mean um, structural integrity or fire and electrical integrity. Sure. It stretches way beyond that. It's, right. a, it's about the people who work within the factory floors. Yeah. So um, we we could be more uh, more focused on on uh, on labor for sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So no, that's uh, and not divided, but probably disjointed. Okay. But do you see uh, some hope for the future as far as that goes? Is thing, are things moving in the right direction? Would you say? Certainly. I, I think we're getting better every day. Yeah. Um, I think uh, we will make it. Um, export, if you remember, we were at a um, 12, 13 billion yeah, just couple of years just back, a few just years a few ago. Years yeah. ago. Mm -hmm. And in the last couple of years, it's just jumped to 28.60 billion. Okay. And then, you know, we're trying our level best to push it further so that at 50, when Bangladesh turns 50, we will have something, we'll have a substantial figure to okay. offer. Fantastic. Well, on that note, I'm going to take a commercial break. Thank you very much. Please join us after the break. I'm in conversation with Dr. Rubana Haq. Thank you. Welcome back. This is Straight Talk. I'm Zafar Subhan. I'm in conversation with Dr. Rubana Haq. Now, Rubana, I wanted to touch on something you'd mentioned earlier. You talked about a sort of an image crisis. And I'm thinking just recently I saw, uh, you know, front page article in The Guardian about the Bangladeshi garment industry. And it seems to me that I'm seeing articles about the Bangladeshi garment industry in international media rather more often than I see it about other countries. Now, now why is that? Is it my imagination or does it seem that the Bangladeshi garment industry specifically is somehow unfairly pilloried. I mean, what's your thought on that? 
I think we are very unjustly and unfairly victimized most of that the time. That would be my uh, assessment. It is, it is. And, and uh, you know, after all the remediation that has right. taken place, it's very unfortunate that we still have to face this. And, and you know, there's always an issue, Zafar. Yeah. Somehow, and it's always related to labor. Right. So even if there's a resolution in some parliament, yeah. they'll just, you know, somehow link it to labor and say, abuse of human rights. And, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just yeah. become a fad to be, uh, to be critical about Bangladesh. But why Bangladesh? I, mean, I can't imagine, you know, of course, you know, we all agree, you know, labor standards is something we all strive to improve at all times, of course. But I find it hard to believe that labor conditions in Bangladeshi factories are somehow uniquely, you know, uh, bad compared to other countries in Asia and Africa. That can't be the case, surely. Absolutely not, because um, post Rana Plaza disaster, yeah. when we suffered the um, the the tragedy, we learned our lessons. Yes. And uh, trust me, Zafar, when I say this, but no compliant factory can afford to abuse labor at this point. Yeah. There's hotline uh, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. workers will call. Um, there's complaint box. So there's no way a worker actually is going to be abused. Sure. Um, uh, and and somehow or the other, nobody ever questions. What the buyer is paying us, what the brands are paying us. That to me is the is 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 the real sixty four million dollar question. We've written a lot about this in the Dhaka Tribune. We had this piece, you know, sort of a forty two dollar shirt. How much does the manufacturer earn? And so, if you look at the article in the Guardian, which I'm talking about, they are, you know, complaining how much the garment worker who made the shirt is receiving, but there's nothing in the article about how much actually the manufacturers are receiving. So, I mean, I think that's really an issue we need to focus on more. Uh, I mean, a 19 pound or a dollar shirt, yeah. a t-shirt is, is probably being sourced at a two dollar level, right? including the prints. Yeah. So, I mean, how do you expect them uh, to ever understand that bit? And every time we are arguing with, with our other um, uh, counterparts, yeah. Everybody is saying the same thing that, you know, price issue is actually not being addressed. And, um, you know, way back in 2013, mm -hmm. the price index uh, of EU, EU used to import uh, around $1,579 per 100 kg. Yeah. That price has now dropped to 1520 I see. So there's a strange and a very sharp dip. Yes. But our exports are increasing because you know we have more capacity. Well, the volume is going yeah. up. Yeah. We have more capacity. We have um, we produce more. We are far more efficient. But somehow the narrative. But this is it. This is what I want to touch on. Isn't changing. How can we get that message out? How can one put pressure on? the brands? How can one put pressure on even foreign governments? Because you get a lot of often lectured by foreign governments saying, well, you know, you need to do a better job here, you need to do this, you need to do that. But, you know, they're not going back to their, you know, their home companies and saying, well, you know, it might make sense if you, you know, paid $2.50 for a garment instead of one fifty. That could make a huge difference. If you're concerned about someone earning 35 cents an hour, there's a very simple way to remedy this problem. But I don't hear those arguments. So how do we create that pressure? I mean, I think that's what needs to be done here. A few companies are trying to yeah. absorb the, the minimum wage increase. Yeah. Nobody's really trying to pay us more. Right. I mean, nobody's paying a green price for a green factory anymore. Sure. I, the green bit is, mm. is, uh, is missing. And it's always top-down approach. It's mm -hmm. always prescriptive. Yeah. And we've never been able to build um, consensus around being proactive. Right. Uh, as a result, everybody takes, it out, takes us out for a ride, pardon me. Yeah. And, mm. uh, and when you talk about margins, um, the brands uh, quite logically also shy away and say, that, you know, we don't have enough margins because our consumers are also getting used to lower prices. Mm -hmm. So buy one, get one free is, is such a concept uh, yeah. that... But maybe that's where one, one should uh, do some kind of a campaign. Because I really think if you look at the West, you look at the EU, you look at the US, those are the big markets for Bangladeshi garments. And then you, you know, you get that message out there that, hey, you know, you love your $5 t-shirt, but you know why it costs $5 or you love your $10 t-shirt. There's a reason. And also, I think, you know, one way of putting pressure on the brands, you know, go to their AGMs. And you know, ask the tough questions because 
consumers at least are you know beginning to become more aware conscious, conscious about these things so i think the uh, i think that the uh, the the field is is set for really you know a, a massive sort of um, educational campaign a lobbying campaign call it what you will uh, one could uh, probably engage in a in a campaign where we could humanize the industry a little bit more yeah i mean i had a very strange idea once and i and i mm -hmm. intend to follow it up I kind of said that, you know, why don't we attach an additional label mm -hmm. to a piece of garment mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and have a scan code. Yeah. And we could just, you know, have a very short video of that uh, garment being produced in that one particular factory. Mm -hmm. And we can have at least a story of one worker there, all in yeah. 10 seconds. And I've done a, I've okay. done a pilot. I, I can share it with you. Okay, yes, that sounds Interestingly fantastic. Interestingly enough, yeah, and, and it's not going to cost us much, yeah. not, not beyond maybe 10 cents at the max. Okay. So I said if we could popularize that and if, if a consumer could be told that you can scan and mm -hmm. get the story of the worker or the factory, yeah, maybe. Yeah, that would be something. Yes, yeah. I mean, the, the article that you're talking about, the Spice Girl, it, it actually has a lot of uh, uh, misinformation as well. Sure. Uh, because the, uh, when they, they, they start the article by saying that the uh, T-shirts were being sold for, for charity which was about um, equality of, of women, right. you know, and about the, the, the pay. And quite interestingly, Bangladesh has been rated by ILO yes. uh, as, as a very positive uh, gender right. paying country, yeah. especially in garments. So th there is a conflict yeah, there. The gender gap, the pay gender yeah. gap in Bangladesh is the lowest in the world. That's it. So. That's a misrepresentation. Right. That's talks a very about good uh, point. The, talks about only the thirty-seven pens and nothing yeah. else. I mean, come on. I mean, that's the lowest grade. Yeah. No, that's agreed. That's okay. Another. So look, hold that thought for a second. I'm afraid we have to take another commercial break, but we'll be right back. Please join us after the commercial break. I'm here in conversation with Dr. Rubana Huck. Thank you. Thank you for returning. This is Straight Talk. I'm Zafar Subhan in conversation with Dr. Rabana Huck. Rabana, we were talking about this Spice Girls, is it? The Spice Girls t-shirt story which we saw in The Guardian. And I think, you know, we both agree there's a lot of holes in that story. It seems such an easy narrative to push forward. But it, as I mentioned earlier, the, to me, the biggest failing in that piece is nowhere in the piece is there any information about how much the garment manufacturer earns. But of for course, print, for making that uh, that T-shirt. So you know, on the one hand, you say it's sold for nineteen pounds fifty, I believe, and then on the other hand, you say, well, you know, and this is what the manufacturer, the worker earns, make, creating the impression that the owner is pocketing the difference. But of course, that's not the case, is it? I think the consumers also understand that. Yeah, it's just that it's a spicy story. Sure. So yes, I think it's just spicy journalism. I think. Mm. Uh, uh, I think it was just very random because it talks about um, the, the worker even saying that they have air conditioning in the factory. Mm -hmm. So you can very well imagine that it's it's a compliant factory right. for sure. It's one of and the better ones. Yes, yeah. it's it's absolutely one of the top ones. Yeah. So um, targeting a factory like that mm -hmm. um, just you know kind of makes you wonder about why it's happening over and over again yeah. and why are being why are we being targeted. This is an area where you guys could help us out as sure. well. Yeah. I think the local media, if you 
got into the details of the story and if yeah. you could have a proper counter narrative and we could yeah. all help you uh, yeah. with all the information yeah. and if you try taking it up that would help our cause. Yeah, and this is something we've tried to do certainly in my newspaper and I think other newspapers as well. And in fact, you know, when I saw the story this morning, the first thing is I sent an, a note to my news editor saying, I want to follow up the story, but our angle is how much did the manufacturers get paid for this shirt? Get me that piece of information, it's missing. And, um, but I think you raise a good point. We talk about pillorying of the garment industry, but it's not just outside Bangladesh, is it? It's inside the country too. I think there is a bit of a image crisis and maybe that's something which can be also addressed. I don't know who one would sit down and talk with about it, but I mean, it seems to me that that does, you know, that is an issue. Uh, you know, Zafar, I, I think uh, a handicap that we may actually have as an, as an industry is that mm -hmm. we are overly defensive. Okay. I think that sort of, that sort of, you know, sends off very wrong signals. All right. So every time anybody says anything about the industry, we keep on saying that, you know, we do enough for our workers, you know, we are the mm. greatest, the economy depends on us. That's not the, that's not the narrative that we should be sure. engaging in. Yeah. I mean, we should be much more open. And saying, and sure, I, and let's work this yes, out together. Yes, and, and yeah. you know, we, we can of course go wrong. Mm -hmm. It's an industry where, where uh, we, we can be uh, failing in, in certain areas. Certainly sure. we've done good and excellent, but there's no harm in admitting that we Where may not have. Better, yes, yeah, of course. Sure. So if we could do that, I think people would trust us more. Yeah. And post Rana Plaza, mm -hmm. I think our attitude has changed. Yeah. Maybe we are not being acknowledged. Yeah. So here, media could play a very, very substantial part. Okay. And I mean, do you also see that uh, something like that has happened within the media as well? You know, people starting to ask sort of more, you know, I don't know, in-depth questions as to you know, as to the whole state of the industry and how, you know, worker relationships. As you said, that acknowledgement, is that something which is developing or do you think we, we need to do a better job? No, I, I think media could certainly do <laughs> a little better yeah. because uh, a couple of days back when, when the unrest was on, mm -hmm. uh, one of the local newspapers wrote a front page, um, six column report and um, you know, it listed all the advantages that a manufacturer receives and bonded warehouse facility. Yeah. I mean, even that was mentioned. Yeah. I cracked up when I saw yeah. that. And I said, I mean, where is this coming from? Sure. I mean, bonded warehouse facility, without that, how would we even export? How is that an advantage? I mean, yeah, but it, yeah, it's sad. That's your point. Yeah, yeah it, it's sad. So, so while we battle um, with the international media, you know, yeah. making these stories, I mean, we would expect and we would hope and we would uh, want you guys to at least cooperate okay. with us so that, it, I mean, there's no harm in doing the story, but at sure. least get our side too. Absolutely. Well, that's just basic journalism. What about support from, uh, from the government? And, uh, you know, is there, if you could have a wish list of, of policy support, what would be on it? Currently, currently, yeah. Currently, if I say this, I'll, I'll probably be very, very unpopular. But at the okay. risk of uh, at the risk sounding of that, yes. <laughs> unpopular, yes. Um, well, with the minimum wage increase, um, yeah. at least 300 to 350 factories will be struggling to pay that because okay. the customers are not paying us extra, sure. a dime extra. Yeah. And we don't have that kind of margins anymore. So maybe uh, the government has. Uh, uh, pays us 2% extra for new markets yep. and 2% for uh, the EU, exports to EU, which has, yeah. I mean, both the figures have gone up to yeah. uh, 4%. But what we would like to request the government for is perhaps uh, just an, an average 2% to 3% uh, export incentive. Okay. That's something that we would probably request. Um, also, um, something that that's going unaddressed, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but DIFI is looking after that also now. There are many factories which are in shared buildings, Zafar. Okay. And that worries me mm -hmm. because these are outside the purview of Accord and Alliance, the two platforms which yeah. basically helped us uh, shape ourselves up. Um, so more factories, more smaller factories should be brought um, uh, under visibility so that okay. we can at least help them by yeah. doing the, the 
the basic minimum thing so that you know basic safety is ensured so i, I worry about the invisible factories sure and uh, is there a regulatory fix for that you think yes i i think the government is beginning to address um, mm -hmm. the factories outside uh, Accord and Alliance. Yeah. Um, there's a national platform. So okay. we need to be more more active. And and honestly, Zafar, I think if there's a fire in any of the less visible factories, yeah. it still impacts us. Of course and it does. And fire yeah. is such an incident, even if nobody dies, mm -hmm. um, it generally happens after eight in the evening sure. because then you, you don't have the trained firefighters in, right. the, in the finishing sections mm -hmm. most of the time. So if overtime could also be you know, controlled Addressed, then you know, yeah. we wouldn't have that. But there are basic things that could be taught to the smaller factories. Okay. Um, and and some kind of support for that would be useful. Some kind of support. The smaller factories also need to live. Fair enough. Um, well, I think that's a wonderful note on which to end this. Thank you so much for giving us your time. I've really enjoyed this. I've learned a lot. I'm sure our viewers have learned a lot as well. So thank you very much, Rana. Thank you, Zafar, for having me. And thank you for tuning in. This has been Zafar Saban on Straight Talk in Conversation with Dr. Rabana Huck. Thank you very much. <laughs>